taking a look at some of the news out of the US, and I mentioned the retail sales number that came through a short while ago, uh, surprising the market to the upside. Yes. Uh, on the other end, actually, we saw consumer sentiment falling to the lowest level in 30 years. So two very different conflicting yeah. numbers, Wayne. But if we look at what's happened in, call it this month, the last three weeks, the panic seems to have left the market. So we've seen all the economic data has told us is that the U.S. is not in recession. It doesn't mean it's growing well. It just means it's growing. So the massive sell-off that we saw in September appears to be unjustified on economic grounds. Uh, we've also seen some, hopefully, some resolution in Europe. It doesn't mean the problem solved. It just means they're going to give enough liquidity to the market so that the markets don't dry up. So quite frankly, we now exactly where we were in August. Not much has changed since August. It went down in September. It's come back up again. The economies are still more or less the same. The debt situation in Europe is more or less the same. We've just seen maybe a little bit more rational reaction of the markets. Mm -hmm. We're not at the start of a new bull market. We're not, I mean, with the world economy is not in a good shape. But just, you know, as I've said plenty of times, it just appears as though the panic has now left. What's also fascinating, we actually had Chinese inflation numbers yes. coming through slightly lower than most had expected. Yeah. Uh, uh, that said, we actually still saw a bit of fear when it comes to China and the interest yeah. rate environment. Me, there is this good news. Yeah, look, it is good news, but to me, the big uncertainty is actually China. I know that sounds, it sounds a little bit odd to say that there's not much uncertainty around. What I mean by that is we know about the U.S. slow growth. We know about the European debt situation. We know about the liquidity situation in Europe. We know about the banks in Europe. We know about Greece. We know all of these. So these are not uncertain. So you actually know it. So we've all the possible negative news. The unknown to us is China. To me, that is by far the biggest uncertainty and unknown. If China carries on chugging along at 7 or 8% growth, we'll all be okay. But if China disappoints on the growth side, South Africa in particular will be very negatively affected. So that's the uncertainty. It's not the US, it's not Europe. And are we also worried about the trade surplus that actually started to narrow even further two consecutive months that we've actually it's seen this, this create a concern? Look, look, weaker rand sorts out your trade surplus virtually overnight. So that doesn't worry me. No, at, uh, at the Chinese trade surplus. Oh, Chinese was, trade yes, surplus. Yes. No, no, look, def definitely. I mean, we will see in the next week or so as to whether the Chinese are back buying commodities. Now, if you look at oil price, it's going up, so maybe they are actually still around. But we will know very soon as to whether China is buying the commodities or not and whether the trade surplus will be sorted out. The exports out of China through to the U.S. and Europe shouldn't change much because we know the U.S. isn't in recession because we've seen economic data now in the last two weeks that says the U.S. is growing between half a percent and one percent. So it won't necessarily be a very big negative on the on 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 the Chinese export data. Let's touch on some corporate news arts in South Africa today. Yeah. Telcom. Yes. Yes. Some good news that we've actually got quite a bit of interest. Well, from the share Korea price was telecoms. up. The Absolutely. share price was up five percent in early today. Now it's only up one percent. And what's quite well, strange? A massive. Um, we saw a big knee-jerk reaction. Yes. So a bit of optimism because this uh, Korean company wants to buy around a twenty percent stake. Yeah. Uh, so amounting to quite a chunky no. part and of thirty-six rand a share. So quite yeah. a nice premium there. Yeah. Look, they're, they're going to issue new shares now. As existing mm. shareholders aren't too happy about this because we're not allowed to participate. So it's not like a rights issue. So someone else is getting shares in Telcom, which means our share in Telcom gets diluted. Now, it would be okay if they were paying a 20% premium because then they would be buying 20% of the shares at a 20% premium. So as other shareholders, you're actually neutral. We're actually worse off now because they're only buying at a 15% premium, but they're giving 20% to the company. Would you say away. we you hold Telcom? The existing, existing Telcom you shareholders. you hold Telcom, where? Very small, but you have got some Telcom, yeah. So actually for non, uh, uh, the people not buying the shares, as the, uh, the existing shareholders, you're actually getting diluted. So it's not good news for you. Uh, that's from a share, well, from existing an investor, shareholder, shareholder perspective. Yeah. What about um, what the overall strategy for the company? Is this good news? For yes, it is. No, no, look, it is good news. They're getting some more cash in the balance sheet, which will pay for ATA because they're going to overspend on ATA. I, I have no doubt about that. Also give them some more CapEx. But more importantly, I mean, Korea is the 
most wired country in the world when it comes to internet and broadband and all of these things that I don't actually so quite understand. So why take interest in a South African telecoms company? Because maybe they see the turn to actually use the infrastructure and get something out there and compete with the cell phone companies and compete with the other service providers. Maybe they see the opportunity there because they have clearly got the expertise to do this. Would, so would you, what would you, your play on Telcom be right now? What would you do with the next move? Look, Telcom has looked cheap for so long and it just continues to look cheap. We're not going to buy any more. Um, we worried that they're going to massively overspend on ATA and never show a profit and end up taking another multi-links story on, on, on ATA. So we're not going to buy any more. We're going to sit with what we got. When it comes to the vote as to whether they should issue 20% or not, we'll have to think about how we, what we're going to do there because you are getting diluted. Mm. Um, but yeah, we're not going to buy any more. Uh, we saw quite a bit of uh, speculation coming through from SAB late last week, this time last week. We spoke on that. Yes. And uh, that seems to have waned completely. Yeah, look, Is we'll, it priced we'll in or people just waiting for the facts? We'll see what happens. But I think there actually probably will be some sort of deal, some sort of consolidation in it. And that's one of the reasons why SAB is going for Foster's, just to make it more difficult, more expensive, high, bigger premium when, you, when, when another person comes in to pay. A buy for you right now? No, it's a bit expensive. No, it's a bit expensive. A bit expensive. Uh, touching on Sassel, we also heard news out earlier this week with regards to its uh, Iranian assets, again, sanctions that could be put forward against all multinational companies that are operating in that region. Yeah. Is that significant enough for you to... Look, it's fairly big, it but understand, understand wherever, wherever multinational companies work worldwide, there's always an issue. They either haven't got the infrastructure or they haven't got the legal system or the governments want to interfere and take a share of it or it's expropriation. It's just, it's the same all around. So these are just the risks of a multinational. And quite frankly, even given this, the Cecil share price is cheaper. This is not expensive. And of course, it went to Exit um, yeah. a little earlier this week. Yes. And speaking of companies that are having trouble in certain geographies, Goldfields in uh, the likes of Kyrgyzstan as well, they're yep. also having drama coming through there. Uh, so again, this is just it's the price just that you the pay. Just the price to pay to, to be a multinational. I mean, it's interesting. We get so worked up about this whole nationalisation debate. This is just one issue. There's issues wherever you go worldwide for these multinationals. So don't think that they sort of saying South Africa is a terrible place to invest because of this nationalisation debate. This is things like this happen in virtually every jurisdiction that they operate in. It's just part of life. So we've seen quite a nice recovery with yes. regards to the commodity prices. And we've got Kumba, which is up 4.5%. Implats up 4.2%. Yeah, Asso is up 3.2%. Well, I mean, and again, the Chinese story. Is this, yeah. is this linked to the Chinese story, Wayne? It's linked, to the, it's linked to the realization that the world is not on the brink of a double dip recession. That's essentially all it's linked to. So now, if you just had to look at the Brent crude price and look at nothing else, it's now almost back at that 120 level where it was before this whole double dip or the second double dip or the double double dip <laughs> story started <laughs> surfacing. So, I mean, who knows what happens next week? Markets are still volatile. But, but are we safely out of that possibility of a double dip? I think so, yes. I mean, I've always maintained that. I've always maintained yeah, for the simple reason, if interest, and let's just talk the U.S., if interest rates are zero in the U.S. and the Federal Reserve have, has pumped trillions into the financial system, if we get a double dip recession given that level of stimulus, yeah. there is no hope. We are in such deep trouble that, quite frankly, I couldn't even consider the possibility of that happening. But yeah. we've seen this before, this kind of fear. And then like what happens is... Exactly the same in the middle of last year. Virtually exactly the same issues in the middle of last year. U.S. long bond plummeted. This time around, U.S. long bond plummeted. Now, the U.S. long bond's up from 1.9 to 2.3 or 2.4 percent. So even that is reversing again. But I want to stress, the problems aren't over eh, at all. The problems the are still very real and very big and with us. the problems the same, Wayne? But what the problems are exactly what, what the same. What we've actually done the is to ensure that, you know, central bank governors, I mean, an example, Timothy Geithner yeah. today talking about the IMF ha having a good supply of resources of money, yeah. to throw at the European debt crisis. Yeah. And all we're doing is just ensuring that no, we don't totally. fall. No, no, look, there's a price to pay for all of this. Nothing in life is for free. There's no free lunch. So at some stage, we'll pay the price. Now, what I don't know is, is the price high inflation? Is the price just a bloated federal balance sheet that they've got to work out over time? Is the price a depreci depreciation of your currency against gold or against other currencies? I'm not sure what the price is. But all you're trying to do is avert a crisis. Now, as we've learned from Lehman's, 
I mean, you never know what the outcome would have been, but maybe if the Federal Reserve had have saved Lehman's, we wouldn't have, the first crisis, the true credit crisis, wouldn't have been so bad, you don't know. But all we're doing now is trying to avert a crisis by throwing money at the problem. And there is an ultimate price to pay for this. You might only pay in five years' time, you might only pay in ten years' time, but there is a price that you pay for this. But I suppose in the shorter term, it's like a, it's like a, a wounded soldier on the battlefield. I mean, you'll give them morphine, even though they might be in five years' time still be addicted to morphine, but at least you're saving their lives. 